Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CNE Sales Monthly Webinar Series. I'm Jeff Butler, the Technical Manager of CNE Sales. Today's webinar is Boldly Go Where No Conduit Has Gone Before. Today's presentation will focus on Banner Engineering's wireless products. Our presenter today is Larry Ponziani. Larry is one of CNE Sales Automation Specialists. If you have questions, please submit them using the tool on the right side of your screen, and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. I'll now turn the webinar over to Larry. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. Um, just I'll reintroduce myself here. Um, my name is Larry Ponziani. I'm an a, a automation specialist with CNE Sales. I've uh, been here about a year and a half. Um, it's a great place, uh, full of uh, knowledgeable salespeople, knowledgeable tech support, knowledgeable salespeople, um, and um, anyhow. So today's topic is uh, Banner Wireless Networks. Um, today we're going to cover uh, several topics. Uh, we're going to look at why you would want to use Banner Wireless Shirt. Uh, Banner Surecross wireless products. Uh, we're going to cover how do they work. We're going to cover technical details and available product types. Where and why with application examples. We're going to talk about how do you set up a network uh, with binding of the radios, site survey, and we'll uh, then get into uh, how do you use uh, and set up the I.O. using a DX80 configuration software available from the Banner website. And we're going to talk about some resources, tech support, website, software, phone numbers, websites, that sort of thing. So at the bottom of the screen down there, you can see some uh, application examples. Again, we'll get into those a little bit further uh, in a couple of screens here. But you can see um, uh, oil and gas, uh, agriculture and irrigation, uh, vehicle detection. We have a number of products for that. Uh, water and wastewater, and uh, factory automation, and like I said, we'll be covering some others here in, a, in a, some future slides here. And there it goes. I was trying to click to the next screen there. So the first question, why Surecross Wireless? Uh, Banner's Proprietary RF protocol coupled with the license-free frequency hopping technology makes for reliable and secure radio communications. Our flexible and easy to commission wireless devices are designed to withstand extreme environmental conditions while maintaining reliable signal transmission over very long distances. So again, why use your cross wireless? Uh, first bullet point there, reduce cost by eliminating the need for cables, conduit, and trenching. Second one there, accomplish what was previously cost prohibitive or impossible using hard wiring. Eliminate loss of productivity by monitoring process to catch problems before they occur. A little bit of preventive maintenance or predictive maintenance. Uh, and then facilitate regulatory, regulatory compliance and avoid costly fines and downtime. Uh, another good reason I, I should have put on here is that uh, these radios and radio networks are easy to deploy. So you, you can actually save time. Uh, you could get something deployed in a day rather than days or weeks if you had to run wire or conduit or uh, find other methods of transmitting your, your I.O. data. So moving on here. Um, questions that you might ask, uh, do you need a license and what frequencies are used? Uh, there's no license required. These are uh, radios that are used on what's called the ISM band, the ISM meaning industrial, scientific, and medical, which is set up by the FCC and I guess globally whatever governing agencies those are. But there's no licenses required, 900 megahertz in North America and 2.4 gigahertz in North America and global. Next one there, how do I know my data is secure? Will this interfere with any of our existing wireless networks? Uh, Banner system does not pose a security threat to any existing network. Uh, this protocol does not operate like an open protocol such as Wi-Fi and is not subject to the risks of an open protocol. 
So in other words, this does not work on a Wi-Fi network. Uh, it's not Ethernet. It's basically their own proprietary radio network. So unless you have banner wireless products and bind them to your gateway, it would be very difficult uh, for someone to hack into that network and sabotage or observe or learn anything about your network because it's it's not a open Wi-Fi uh, unproprietary network. So the next one there, how far can my signal travel? The 150 milliwatt radios, 250 milliwatt radios have a three mile line of sight range. Uh, these uh, are dependent obviously on the conditions uh, surrounding uh, the radios. So if you've got uh, buildings and trees and hills and other obstacles in between your radios, uh, your signal is probably still going to make it, but your range is going to be a little bit less. So uh, and we'll get into a little bit more about site survey uh, here in a few more slides, but uh, the one watt radios have a six mile line of sight range. And uh, some of these distances can also be extended by the use of repeaters. And you can set up a gateway as a repeater to extend your signal distance. Uh, the signals can penetrate floors and walls and other indoor obstructions. So using them indoors is usually pretty reliable and very predictable. However, uh, you do need to kind of keep in mind that, you know, if your radio is next to a, an aisleway that maybe fork trucks are driving by and that the fork truck would act to block the signal in some additional way. Um, the other is uh, like for an outdoor application where in the wintertime you don't have leaves on your tree and in the summertime you do have leaves on your tree. And those leaves would act to absorb some of that radio uh, signal. And in general, water would absorb a signal and metal would reflect a signal. So you can use those to uh, help with your uh, network layout. The integrated site survey capability that's built into these radios also uh, can be used to evaluate the RF signal strength. In fact, if you needed a, a site survey, survey done in your facility, we would bring in the actual radios that we would be deploying in, in your application. Uh, to ensure that you have plenty of signal strength and low loss and low miss packets and that sort of thing. Can I, in, <clears throat> excuse me, can I install multiple networks in my facility? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, the, the binding of the radios is similar to like pairing your wireless headset to your phone with Bluetooth, uh, but is actually even more secure than that. It's, it's basically, it's a proprietary network again and it has its own special methods of making sure that your signal is secure. What happens if I lose my signal? Uh, the system defines how the network endpoints behave during the loss of communications, and I'll point that out when we get into the live demo here at the end of our uh, demonstration here, or end of our webinar. Uh, the network identifies when the communications link is lost, and sets relevant outputs to user-defined conditions. You can have it turn on outputs, you can have it turn off outputs, you can have it leave it in the last state. Um, and then uh, once the radio signal is reestablished, the network returns to normal operation. So that's uh, basically, and then um, the last one there is how long will my ba battery last? Uh, some of these are battery operated, not all of them are, uh, and a lot of them also have the capability to uh, have a battery backup with a uh, power input so that you can uh, use the battery as just basically a backup. But anyhow, if you're using a battery only, um, it depends um, on your sample rate, your sensor warm-up time, your current draw. Um, if you have the uh, specifications on the devices that you're going to be looking at, uh, we can give you an idea of those, um, how long your battery will last based on uh, your needs for your data and your current draw of that device. So hopefully that answers some of the questions that you might have right off here. 
So the, a little bit about the technology. Um, most of the radios work on a frequency hopping sped, spread spectrum format. And basically this works in a frequency band that uh, uses a one megahertz uh, uh, interval in between each of the sub uh, frequencies within that band. And when you bind your radio, uh, it not only trades a, uh, a serial number, I guess, with that gateway to your node, but it also swaps a frequency hopping table so that when your gateway and your node are communicating, it knows to, to jump from, let's say, in this in instance, it goes from 25 to like 15, down to three, and then back to 27, and it just jumps around in a predetermined fashion that it has uh, determined when it did the binding process. So, um, and then some of the radios still uh, work on a time division multiple access, and that's also shown there on the right-hand side. And then uh, we did talk already about the uh, the three mile and six mile line of sight um, capability for the, your your distance for your signal. So the next thing we're going to talk about are your different um, architectures for your radios. You can have a point to point, a point to point with repeater. Uh, star network, which is point to multipoint. So you can see we've got a master and several slaves. You can do up to 47 of these slaves connected to a single master. If you need more than that, you can go and get a second master and have a second radio network, and they will not interfere with each other, and they will work independent. Uh, and then there's also a tree network, which is similar to the star, but uh, you can see there's some repeaters in there that act as kind of a, a sub- uh, collection point for your data. So we're going to talk about these a little bit more in detail, um, each of those four architectures. Um, so the first one, the point-to-point -point networks, uh, it's basically a standalone network. Uh, this is probably the most common, most basic, um, like if you just needed to bring some analog and digital signals from, let's say, a uh, like you have a tank maybe out uh, across the field that you're storing your raw product and you need to get tank level and you need to be able to open and close a valve, you need to be able to read a temperature maybe or a pH or something. You can bring those signals into your node, um, wirelessly bring those back across to your gateway that you can then wire the signals that it basically parallels from your node into your PLC or your data collection system or whatever. So um, it's basically a standalone network with a gateway and a node. And then you can see some of the products here. We'll just talk about these products um, sort of one time as far as the, uh, uh, the, the packaging goes. Um, this type of packaging uh, is an IP67. Now they do make a similar packaging that, that is an IP, uh, it basically has terminals on the side. I'm, I think that's probably IP20. But it also has uh, some sensor um, products here. It's got board level products. Um, there's also serial radios and ethernet radios. However, um, the ethernet radios have about a 300 uh, kilobyte per second um, transfer rate. So it's, it's much slower than a typical wireless network. But what you get out of this versus like a Wi-Fi is you get a lot of range. You can get a six mile range across an ethernet, but again, it's going to be a little bit slower than your typical uh, uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, then there's also performance gateways and nodes, which basically have ethernet capabilities. Uh, Multi-hop, uh, this is what you would use if you wanted to extend your distance. Uh, Multi-hop board type radios and even hazardous area type uh, radios. So it gives you an idea. There's a broad range of devices for a broad range of point of uh, network types. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of products to choose from. So moving on here. So the next one is a point to point with a repeater. Very similar. Uh, the repeater can act as a uh, method to either extend your range or get you around some obstacle or to 
uh, maybe make sure that you're getting a signal without an in interference from uh, occasional like a, a semi truck pulling in in front of it or a fork truck or something like that. So um, these are also standalone network. Uh, gateway is used as a repeater between the two nodes. So there would be a little bit of additional setup with the uh, configuration software to map the data from this through the gateway to the other node. Again, you can see similar family of products uh, for the point to point with a repeater. Moving on here. Uh, the next type of network is a star network. Uh, this is also very common where you might have uh, your, your gateway uh, located near your PLC or data collection system or in your maintenance shop, whatever that your application calls for. And then you have various nodes located around your plant to look at whatever you want to look at. You can be looking at doors, gates, tanks, uh, lighting, uh, whatever you want to look at um, with these products, uh, you can distribute with with a lot of ease and a lot of time savings and a lot of money savings. Um, so again, let's move on here. So and then the tree network is uh, the last network product we'll talk about, and that one is similar to the star network, but uh, again, it can use a, a repeater in the uh, process here, both to extend your range and or uh, it can be used to concentrate some of your signals um, and filter out some of your signals so you're not bringing all your raw data back to your master. And uh, uh, you can get use it to get around obstacles. And uh, so, okay, um, make sure I haven't missed anything. Again, you can see we've got number of products that fit that category, including serial and Ethernet data radios. So that covers the, kind of the four basic types of network products that are available. We're not going to go into a lot more details on the technical side of things. Um, and again, if you do have more further questions concerning the technical details or in general anything that you need, if you need a site survey or a uh, sample product or a visit and look at some of our demo products, uh, we'd be happy to do that. So moving on here. So next thing we're going to do, we're going to look at some applications that these are used in, in common places. Uh, the, the top picture there, and you know, they, they kind of correspond to the, to the uh, descriptions on the left there, but uh, the first product that we're showing here, they have a brand new product, relatively new, uh, came out this year. Uh, it's a vibration temperature sensor. You can see that it's got a little sensor module here and a uh, transceiver here to um, send and receive the signals back to a gateway. It also has an indicator light and um, you can use it to uh, set thresholds. You can turn on and off the light based on the thresholds here. You can turn on and off the light being controlled back from your gateway and or your PLC. Uh, and it does have two outputs for that. There's a yellow light and a red light. Uh, the sensor, um, the vibration sensor can be used to determine if you've got a problem with your, a motor, a bearing, a belt. Uh, you can put it on a compressor. You can put it on a piece of machinery. You can put it on a vibratory feed. Um, whatever you want to look at, um, it gives a, uh, a signal in millimeters per second and inches per second. So a real world uh, values that you can use to baseline or determine if there's problems with a motor or any any part of your plant or machinery. Another common use for this is uh, if you have issues either with uh, an existing conduit and wire or if you want to just not have to trench and pull wire, like in this application they're showing uh, that you know they're connecting this to a tank, maybe they're looking at Certainly they'd be looking at level, but they might be looking at temperature of the fluid that's in there. They might be wanting to control a valve that uh, turn, the opens and closes to uh, feed that raw product into your plant. And then uh, back in the plant, you'd have a gateway that you'd be able to uh, read the inputs and write to the outputs. Over in this other picture here, we've got a, a, a 
uh, unit being used to look at a, a door opening and closing, basically it's like security. Uh, they have products that would be applicable for um, a uh, looking at like a truck entry, a gate, being able to control the gate to go up and down or open and close, and also the status of uh, with the M gauge products that you can embed in the in the driveway can sense if cars are either parked there or truck pulls up or anything like that. Um, also energy monitoring is a is a, a good use for these. You can use it uh, like a service entrance to count kilowatt hour pulses. You can use it at uh, to determine when you know motors are running to um, know how much energy is basically being used. You can use it at a uh, meter and uh, looking at the dial of that meter, counting revolutions of the dial, or uh, that sort of thing. Um, the facility operations side of things, um, you can see down in the bottom picture down there, they're looking at a parts presence uh, application. The, uh, the only concern with using wireless on uh, facility uh, operations. I guess in that mode I'm talking about manufacturing is that these should not be used for real-time applications. In other words, you don't want to use this to uh, control like a cutoff or something on a, a blade. You want to use these when you're comfortable, when you can lose a signal for maybe a second. And, uh, and also that you are able to continue your operation even if that signal is lost. So you want to make sure that you're using these in the right application. Uh, we talked about the access, lighting, and security. Um, you can use it to monitor problems when and where they occur, temporary or permanent installation in minutes rather than days, and it can be used as an excellent maintenance tool, especially the uh, vibration temperature sensor. If you have a problem with a motor or a rooftop unit or something like that that it's not basically easy to get to or it's not something somebody watches all the time, um, a maintenance man can have this in his toolkit or available for him to use to uh, go out and use, um, be able to go out and determine if there's an issue and warn him that something might be going wrong. So I think we got one more page of applications here. You can see this is, and I'll, I'll go through these a little faster here. These are, uh, this could be used like for a parts call. You can see we got some bins there and they're basically saying, you know, hey, I, I need some more raw materials. It goes over to the storage side of the building and the operators know to go deliver some parts to this, this operator. Uh, another very uh, useful use for these is uh, like code compliance sort of things. So like in this case, it's a safety shower. Uh, you can get a like a Gemco flow switch, and uh, we've got one that uh, actually even has a temperature sensor built into it. So you can tell uh, if the safety shower or eye wash station is being used. And also you can tell by the, the temperature sensor if the water is going to be too hot or too cold. Uh, maybe you can put a heat trace on your uh, pipe. Make sure that, you know, the temperature is is appropriate for a safety shower. You know, you don't want to be uh, dumping hot water <laughs> into some poor guy that just uh, spilled acid on himself or something. So uh, a lot of a lot of very useful uh, applications for safety and compliance. Another one is uh, runoff, like rain runoff and retention ponds. Uh, make sure that your level's not changing abruptly or you've got a leak or or something like that, and also that there wouldn't be any sort of overflow. Um, tank level monitoring and control, uh, facility operations monitoring, again, we talked about that in the last slide. Uh, remote monitor and control com of pumps, compressors, uh, gate access and security. I think um, there's a uh, uh, solution for whatever application you might be thinking about with these very versatile. So a little bit more on the uh, the setup side now. Um, the, the radios are fairly easy to set up. We got, I got kind of a fuzzy picture of, of a radio up there. Um, 
in order to bind the radios, there's, there's basically two methods, but the simplest method is that you triple click your button number two over here. I put a little arrow to show button two, and on the other side is button one. You triple click that, it sends it into binding mode. Now when you're doing this, it takes your, your gateway offline. So it's no longer going to be scanning your network for your I.O. signals. It's going to be uh, uh, looking for other nodes to bring into the network. So you have to keep that in mind if you're expanding an existing network. You can't just, you know, willy-nilly kind of start it into binding mode or else you're going to be knocking everything else offline and there might be uh, ramifications to that. So, uh, and then basically on your node, you'd triple click uh, that same button. It would go out and it would say, oh, I see a gateway that's in binding mode also. I'm going to go ahead and bind to that. So uh, you would basically, before you would triple click that button, you'd want to set your address on your nodes uh, with the rotary dials underneath the cover. And that would be your address that is then sent to the gateway to say, this particular coded product is, let's say, node number, in this case, node number 10, with a 1 and a 0. And then uh, when you're done, um, once, the, once the node finishes binding, it's, it's going to go back into run mode. And then uh, on the gateway, you'd have to uh, single click either of the buttons to exit the binding mode. Now, there is another method of, of doing a binding um, where you basically you get the code for your gateway and your node and you can hand enter those into uh, your uh, appropriate products. And uh, there's a description of that in the manual. You know, again, probably the most common way is using the triple click on the buttons. And then if you do it with the coding, you know, where you take the code from each of the two uh, units, uh, that would not take your gateway offline. So if you're adding to your network, that's probably the solution that you'd want to go go with. Okay, moving on here. So the site survey mode is a, it's a feature that's built into the gateways that allows you to measure the signal strength and reliability uh, of your devices on your network. So basically you would set your dip switch to your target node that you want to uh, make sure your signal strength on. And uh, it will start into uh, a site survey that would then flash between the screens that are shown there on the right with uh, the G, the Y, the R, and the M. It's kind of a green, yellow, red, like a stoplight sort of thing. And then the M is multiple resets. And that's basically where the signal didn't make it to the destination and it had to resend the packet. And, uh, and then obviously the green is, is good, the yellow is, well, green is saying excellent, yellow is good, and red is marginal. So you can use this to kind of gauge how reliable your signal is. Obviously, if you're getting 100 greens and 0, 0, and 0 for your, your yellow, red, and your, uh, and your, mar and your multiple resends, uh, you've got a pretty reliable network. Even if this gets down into like 50, 25, 10, and 10, you know, you're, you're going to have a pretty good radio signal. But it also depends on your threshold of pain for a lost signal. Again, you have to keep that in the back of your mind and keep that evaluation active, even after the deployment of these. Again, you know, wintertime can have different radio characteristics than springtime because of leaves on trees and weather conditions, uh, thunderstorms, that sort of thing. Um, so it, what we would do if you guys, anybody who needed a site survey done, we would bring out two radios and we would use the built-in site survey mode on these radios. So it would be a very realistic evaluation of your application. Make sure that your signal from your source to your destination and back again is strong and reliable. Uh, there are, are also antenna options that can also help improve your uh, radio transmission. So the standard uh, antenna that comes with the unit is obviously what we'd start with, but if, if we were not getting a good signal, we'd either be looking at repeaters or better antennas or a more appropriate placement of the gateway or the node. 
Okay, moving on here. So uh, next thing we're going to do, we're going to start uh, into the DX80 user configuration software. Uh, this software is available for free on the website. Uh, it's www.bannerengineering.com. And if you go to uh, wireless networks and products, I think. In fact, here, I can go over to this. So you just go to Wireless Sensor Networks. This is, uh, this is their home page, Wireless Sensor Networks. And I'm not going to kill you with this web page here. And then um, Wireless Support and Software and User Configuration Tool. And there's a 32-bit and a 64-bit. Obviously, I would use the 64 if I had a 64-bit machine. So let's go back to our PowerPoint here. Uh, it, it'll bring up an icon on your screen. That's what it looks like. And um, it's used for I.O. mapping, monitoring your network status, and other system parameters. And again, it is free, which is unusual in the world of industrial controls to have free software. So there's a couple of screenshots here, but we're actually going to get into the actual product here in just a second. So uh, it's a very easy, intuitive uh, software. And again, there's plenty of tech support behind it, both from CME Sales and from Banner. Uh, one of the other devices that ought to be uh, purchased if you're going to start into a wireless network is a uh, USB to RS-485 converter with a power supply that is actually used to power your wireless device. Um, the truth of it is, is you could use a standard USB to 485 converter. However, the beauty of this is that it already has the M12 connector built into it, and there's also a uh, pigtail type for use with the board level type uh, modules that do not have the M12 connector. The M12 connector are on the IP67 units. The other thing that's nice about these is that it has a 24 volt power supply built into it, so it also self powers the unit. So when you're doing a setup, uh, this tool is very useful. So um, if you're going to start into, your, into a wireless network with Banner Wireless, uh, this is a, a very useful tool to have. Again, the, the software is free. A little snapshot of it down there. We'll be getting into it, into it here in just a moment. So um, I wanted to show a little picture here of my, my demo equipment that we're going to be looking at with the actual... Um, software here, and hopefully I'm all plugged in, and I am, okay. Um, so on the right-hand side over here, I'll just describe some of these products. We actually have a wireless light tree. Now, this does require 24 volts. I've got it plugged in back here. But what this does is you don't have to do anything more than supply 24 volts to it. This one actually even has a horn in it, and you can mount that up on the wall. You don't need to run conduit or anything else to it, and you, you have a, a light tree for whatever indication purposes you want. Uh, in this case, I've got it uh, set up for a uh, parts call scenario that I use in conjunction with this little push-button indicator uh, radio over here on the left-hand side. So continuing on then, we'll, we'll look at our I.O. products here. There's a, a wireless uh, photo eye that we have here. Um, this is a wireless uh, uh, input unit that I have wired actually to a Namor proximity switch. It's, and Namor is a, um, a hazardous location type proximity switch and they're used with, the, with uh, Banner Wireless because they're very low power. Again, these are battery operated units, so power is always a consideration. And then uh, next to that we've got a uh, wireless vibration temperature sensor. You can see we've got the transceiver here and we've got the sensor. And then I've got a little demo that I'm going to be doing. I, I stick this unit up on this little vibration table, and I'll show you the numbers as they change along there. Then um, I've got a, a light tree that's actually physically wired into this unit, and then I've got a little light indicator here that works off of the, uh, the photo eye and the proximity switch. And uh, the, this radio is a, uh, an Ethernet radio that I actually have with a couple of products that are are not being shown. 
and this is a board level unit that I have uh, wired up to a variable frequency drive. And then uh, these two units are actually uh, daisy chained together. I'm communicating to it via um, RS-485, and this is the cable that goes back to my computer. Then over on the left-hand side, we've got a uh, Siemens HMI that I'm just basically looking at the I.O. inside each of these units to uh, show what the data is doing and give some real-world examples and that sort of thing. So anyhow, let's, um, before we get into questions here, so we're going to go over to our user configuration. What we're going to do, we're going to go to our desktop. Okay, and so here's my user configuration tool right here. I'm going to power that up. Fire it up, I should say. Okay, it opens it up. What it tries to do is it tries to find, you know, the basic um, unit. Right now I do have it plugged in, but I do have it set for a different address and some baud rates because of my, uh, the variable frequency drive that I had to have with this um, determined my, my baud rate and uh, parity and data bits and all that. So basically the first thing I need to do is go down to settings. I'm going to tell it that it's 9600, I've got it at even parity, and 23. These would be specific to your application. Okay, You can set those on the unit itself, or you can um, set it using this tool. Uh, once you get online with it, you can set you know, your baud rate if I wanted to change it, uh, and I can uh, you know, set it and, and control uh, parity and my address. So. But in this case, I already know what I've got. I'm going to do a connect. And it's not going to connect here. Of course. You know, I just tested this this morning. Oh, you know why? Is because it's already connected here. Okay, you can see that it's ready. Okay, it made, made the communication. So down in this little status bar, you'll see as I'm reading things and writing things that this status bar will show you an indication. On the left hand side here in the software you're going to see several buttons. Um, it's very intuitive, very simple to, to navigate. Sometimes the buttons will, will have additional buttons on them obviously. So why don't we go in and let's look at our register view. Okay, And what this is is it is basically looking at what your gateway has on it and it's able to uh, read and write through that gateway to your different nodes. So what we're going to do, um, this read registers, I can do a read on it and it's going to show me my gateway and my four nodes. So if we went back over here and looked at uh, my little picture here, what we're doing, we're talking to this node right here I shouldn't say no, this gateway here. This gateway is connected to this light tower, which is address number two, this vibration temperature sensor, which is address number five, and then we've got uh, one, two, and three with these guys. Okay, so we've got five nodes on this network. So let's go back to our configuration tool. And we're going to... Um, and, and so I've got this set up so that it looks at all of my five nodes and my gateway. And then these are all the data registers associated with each. Let me expand that out so we got a little bit easier to see. Right now I only did a single read, and it's a manual. So every time I want to see the data, I have to actually hit read, and it'll update the data. But if I put it in, and I'm actually going to make this one second so we see it a little bit more real time. I'm going to expand 5 and 6 here because we're going to actually take a look at it's still active here. Yeah, in fact, I need to take it out of read here. If I can catch it. Okay, there we go. Let me stretch that out and that out a little bit. We're going to see 5 and 6 changing with our vibration temperature sensor. And let me make sure that's online. You don't see me working in the background here. <laughs> and we're going to go auto. And so right now, these values are... take off here in just a few minutes. You so. taking care of yourself, bud? I am. I am. Yeah. 
Okay, sorry about that, people. Um, it was kind of tough to talk over somebody else there, but uh, okay. Now I'm out of breath because I just ran back and forth <laughs> across the building. But anyhow, you know, if, if something didn't go wrong, you guys would be disappointed. So um, hopefully you're not disappointed. <laughs> uh, okay, so what we're going to do, get back into this. We're looking at our registers. Now I'm out of breath. But uh, um, we, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to turn on this little vibration table. Again, we can uh, pop this up. And we're going to turn, we've got this guy located on here, and we're going to uh, turn on this little vibration table, and uh, we're going to uh, watch our values change. Now, this number in number five is in inches per second, and the value in number six is in millimeters per second. You could do the calculation, and yeah, it's two point or 25.4 or whatever times or something like that. Uh, but anyhow, it's it's an implied four decimal places on each. So right now, like, um, you know, if it's reading one point, or if it's reading 10,000, that would correspond to 1.0000. Okay, and um, so when as I turn this on, let me make sure my, okay. You might hear a little buzzing in the background, and that's because uh, the vibration table is what you're hearing. So you can see that our value then went up to uh, 10508, you know, 10510, so on. Uh, that corresponds to 1.0508 inches per second. Okay, as I increase my vibration table, you'll see that value goes up. Okay, and I'm going to increase it to the point where you know, it's at its maximum amount, which is at about two inches per second. Now, this sensor, and, you know, and there's quite a bit of vibration in this, but it's, uh, um, it's only about a third of what this can read, okay? It'll go up to 6.5535. I mean, you, you recognize that number. And uh, the same with the... Uh, this field. So, you know, there's a little less um, high end in the millimeters per second, uh, but you get a little bit more resolution in the inches per second uh, than you would, I'm sorry, in the millimeters per second than the inches per second. So, then also in this field, uh, I think it's in field number three, you've got uh, a temperature sensor there, and uh, uh, that is scaled uh, the one, if you take one decimal place over and divide by two, that's degrees Fahrenheit. So that would roughly correspond to about 74 degrees, no, 79 degrees, right? Something like that. Now, each component has its own map of uh, these registers, okay? And these registers can be uh, read by your PLC or uh, they can be actually mapped to your your node. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this guy off just so that it stops that vibration. So uh, on node number, let's see what node this is. Node number three, I'm going to uh, flash the, um, the photo eye. That's this guy right here is node three, and this guy is node four. So as we flash these guys, so that should be node number three. You can see that that changed to a one from a zero. And I just removed it, and there it's back from, you know, uh, I'm sorry, 0 to 1, and now back to 1 to 0. And then here's our little Namor prox switch. And that radio must not be on because it's, yeah, I didn't turn that radio on yet. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not going to work to get that turned on. But uh, anyhow, I think you get the idea with this. You can look at your data with this. Um, you know, it is doing an automatic read on there. I just turned that off. Some of the other features of the software, um, you can actually go in and you can write to your outputs. Typically, your outputs start at number 9 and go on through 16. So there's 9 through 16. But again, you need to look at your IO map for your specific product to make sure that, you know, for instance, 9 it might be a yellow light on, on one unit and it might be a, uh, an output 
terminals on another unit. So again, you do, you know, they are specific to the type of unit and you do get a very thorough data sheet with each product that you buy with these. So if I wanted to make a change, like if I wanted to turn on or off a, an IO at my gateway, an output at my gateway, I double or, you know, click the check mark, make that a one or a zero. And I think you can make it even a, a register number. You know, you can make it a, a value if that's appropriate. And uh, you send write to it, and it will um, send that data over. Now, if there is some other mapping that's going on, it might overwrite that immediately. So in other words, uh, depending on your I.O. mapping, that may or may not turn things on. So don't think that this is the ultimate method of, of uh, turning on and off your, your I.O. Okay? And then this gauge parameters down here is what you use to set up these gauges. You got these three gauges available. Right now, I've got it set up for, hang on, set up for uh, node number five, IO number five, that's my vibration sensor, uh, node five, IO number two, which is also that sensor, and node five, IO three, which is also that same temperature sensor, 374 degrees. Uh, so if you wanted to make a change, you wanted to look at a particular one, you can go over here to your gauge setup, set up your gauges, change it to gauge number one, two, or three, tell it whether you want it to be a gauge, a thermometer, a tank level, or digital, and you tell it what node you want to look at, what I.O. point you want to look at. Again, this is the I.O. point that is associated with, with these, so like I.O. 5 would be looking at that register. And again, they are specific to each type of node or gateway. Okay, I don't want to beat that one to death, but anyhow. And then uh, you've got the type of, of I.O. If you wanted to look at the raw value, which this one was, 0 to 65, you know, 65, 535 actually, but uh, you can have it looking at temperatures or analog, volts, degrees, and so on. Okay, so moving on here, next, uh, next point here down, button down, uh, device configuration. So this is what you would set up specifics for a particular node. Okay, so like if you, node 5 again is my vibration temperature sensor. And let's say I want to look at node IO number 5. I want to make some adjustments on IO number 5. You can see there's a whole slew of different uh, characteristics that you can modify with that particular I.O. number. You can look at sample rate, report rate, uh, thresholds, units, warm-up time. The warm-up time is what you would uh, set. Um, you'd use that in conjunction with your sample rate and your report rate to uh, make sure that you're not burning up a your battery. In other words, like if you're looking at a tank level, you can use those that warm-up time, sample rate, and report rate to um, sample like a tank level every 10 minutes or something, or every five minutes, whatever is appropriate for your application. And that would help save your battery life. Uh, so you can see there's all kinds of things here. And then uh, let me just go to report rate. And what that did is it popped up the specifics of that parameter down below. So you can read into there. You can say a report rate defines the rate that the I.O. status is reported back to the gateway. The value represents the number of 62.5 millisecond increments. In other words, you, know, you, sh you, you put in an, in, uh, an integer value into your value here, and then you multiply that number times 62.5. That's your report rate. So if you needed to do let's just say six and a quarter minutes, you'd put, what would you put in there, 100? <laughs> I don't know. You get the idea, though. It's, um, I can't do math without a calculator anymore. Um, you, you take the amount of time, divided it by the 62.5 milliseconds, and that number is what you'd want to put in there. That would be your report rate. Now, you do have to, to uh, hit your get and your send. Well, let's look at what our report rate was on that. So this one is a constant report rate. So when it's set to zero, there will only be a report at the change of state. 
um, values of zero. In other words, it's kind of a constant thing with this particular input. So I think you get the idea. Now there are some other tabs here at the top. Uh, device information, you know, you can get the information from it. Um, let's look at number five, get info. You can see down at the bottom down here, it's saying it's busy. It's doing the read on that. Um, while it's doing this, while it's doing its read, it's still taking care of reading the other nodes also. This one will not interrupt your uh, communications. So it's telling me my firmware, my model number, my production date, and then the serial number. The serial number is your code to your bind. Okay, so if you do need to do a manual bind, that's the number you'd want. This number is on a sticker that's in a, the inside of the unit, typically. Okay. Uh, device store, restore. You can save devices, parameters. You can send it. Uh, this is the site survey mode. So if I wanted to look at my site survey for number five, we're probably going to see a real strong G in here. Let's start it. You can see it's it does a, a traveling window on the communications, okay? And on my gateway, I don't know if you noticed in the picture, but I actually removed the antenna on it because my units are so close together that um, it's kind of like using a bullhorn to try and whisper in somebody's ear. You know, you're, you're blasting a lot of power. So that's why we're not getting 100% on here, but the most important part is the missed signals are uh, very low. Well, and then we just popped one in there, but. Again, you know, we're, I'm sitting right next to the unit uh, with the gateway. Okay, and, and some of it, the network formation, this would be used if you're doing uh, repeaters or uh, even uh, just setting up a star network. It'll tell you um, what's on your network. So we're just going to do a quick review on that. It'll show me my gateway and my five nodes. Okay, and there we go. Um, I guess... Um, I'm wondering why it's not showing my, my signal strength here, but there's probably a setting I need to set on that. But Anyhow, then uh, the last thing we'll cover in here is the I.O. mapping. Uh, the system parameters and the master mode are a little bit more advanced. Um, we'll just cover real quickly on those, but uh, if you wanted to set um, the number of devices in your system to a lower number so that it, it has a little bit faster communication, you know, in other words, a round trip take less, takes less time. But the word of caution with this is that if you were to choose eight on this, you can only use node addresses one through eight. So even though it says number of devices in the system is eight, you can't go past node number eight, okay, or node 16, 32, 48, and so on, okay? Um, and there, there are some other uh, polling configurations, heartbeat, device health. The master mode, uh, uh, you can uh, use this to relay your signals across to your other devices. So the I.O. mapping, we're just going to go through that and uh, we'll be pretty close to uh, completing here. Um, so what you use the I.O. mapping for is that if you want to take data from one node, you can pass it through a gateway and, and send it on to another node. This is where you would set that up. So let's look at, uh, let's look at node number one, which was my little push button station there. And what we have is uh, node one, I.O. one, I'm sending to node two, I.O. number nine. Okay, this was already pre-set up. And basically, I uh, node 2, number 9, was uh, a light on my light tower. So when I press that button, then the light tower would turn on. Okay, and it's still busy here getting that data. Again, this occurs while the gateway is processing all the rest of the data. In other words, it does not interrupt everything else that it does in its normal activities of communicating. Okay, and uh, so node two is my light tower. So I'm not relaying anything from my light tower. It's basically everything is being sent to node two. 
node 3. I think I've got that set to go to my gateway. Yeah, so node 3 is my photo eye, and I've got that just turning on an output on my gateway, output number 10, which in turn turns on uh, this little light here, which is a little green light. It also has a red light, and I've got this guy mapped in through here to turn on the red light. Okay, so the mapping is is very easy and straightforward with this addressing tool. So I could go on and on with this for hours, <laughs> maybe. Um, no, really, there's not that much to it. Uh, you've got um, I.O. that you want to get from point A to point B, and Banner Wireless is a good way of doing it. So let me go ahead and close this out. And uh, we're going to go on to the next slide here, which is basically just asking questions. And I need to get back to my little webinar pane to see if I've got any questions in here that I can answer. And if anybody does have any questions, pop them in here. Um, but, uh, you know, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, I think I'm, I'm hoping that I answered a lot of those questions. Those were the things that I wanted to answer in this PowerPoint. But if you do have any questions, uh, we want to invite you to um, contact CE &E Sales. Uh, if you know who your salesman is in your territory, uh, you can contact him directly or you can call our office directly and ask for sales or technical support. Um, the phone number to reach us is area code 800-228-2790. And uh, it's on this PowerPoint, so you will be getting a, um, a copy of this in your, in your mail. So finally, we've got uh, some resources that are listed here. The Banner website, www.bannerengineering.com. Um, I do have a little bit more to the to the link there showing you know the Surecross sure cross wireless uh, web homepage uh, and a phone number here for technical support. They're up out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then uh, the CNE website, uh, cnesales.com, and our contact information. So um, I think that wraps things up, and we are actually right at the right time. And um, I hope, uh, again, if anybody has any questions, um, please uh, give us a call. You can ask for me, Larry, uh, or talk to your salesperson. We'd be happy to come and do a demonstration, a site survey, uh, show you the products. Um, and it also invites you to take a look at the Banner website and take a look at that. So thank you for attending the webinar. Um, hope you liked it. Um, Again, if you have any questions, contact your salesperson or call our office. And thank you for attending. Have a safe and happy holiday. Thank you.